AP Biology Third Quarter Review, Part 1. Our review topics for this uh, review for the final next week is DNA's discovery, DNA structure, replication, transcription, translation, evolution, and classification. We started the quarter with the uh, road to discovery for DNA being the genetic material that codes for new living things. One of the experiments that we talked about was Griffith's experiment. Griffith um, was trying to figure out what it was that was transforming bacteria. Now, if you remember, we had uh, three control groups and one experimental group. You uh, inject the mouse with the smooth cells that cause disease, the mouse dies, no surprise. You inject the mouse with the rough cells that don't cause disease, no problems, the mouse is fine. If you kill the disease-causing S cells, the smooth cells, the mouse is okay, no surprise there. However, when you mix the heat-killed smooth cells that cause disease, cause pneumonia, and you mix it with the living R cells that don't cause disease in the mouse, the mouse dies. And when you pull out some of those cells from the mouse, some of the bacteria that killed the mouse, it turns out that they all are living S cells. So how did those R cells turn into S cells and the S cells were dead? So something inside those heat-killed S cells transformed the living R cells to become S cells. And that was later discovered to be DNA. Now, they suspected it was DNA, but they weren't sure at this point. So it could have been proteins. We didn't really know way back in time. You don't have to know the dates, but you should know something about uh, the experiments. The next experiment that I want you to know about is the Hershey and Chase experiment. Now, viruses infect cells, and somehow they create uh, new viruses within the cell. And at the time, we didn't know what was the codes for making new viruses. So the experiment for Hershey and Chase involved having a radioactive protein coat to try to figure out if it's the protein coat that's going inside the bacterial cells that are infected, or if it was the DNA that was going inside the um, bacteria and infecting the uh, cells. So if the protein coat of the virus had the genetic information, and they didn't know what this looked like at the time, then you should have found radioactivity inside the cells. However, no radioactivity was found inside the cells. This showed it was not the protein coat that was actually infecting the cells and holding the codes for making new viruses. The radioactive phosphorus found in the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA was um, injected into the, the viruses, and then the viruses were free to infect the cells. As it turns out, the DNA um, with the radioactive uh, phosphorus on it was found inside the bacterial cells, indicating that it was DNA not the protein coat that was infecting these bacteria. Now remember, phosphorus is not found in things like proteins. We find it in the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. So these are two things that uh, couldn't be confused for each other and identify DNA as genetic material, not protein. The next experiment that you should know is uh, Shargoff. Shargoff um, discovered that um, the percentages of Adenines and thymines were about equal, and guanines and cytosines were about equal. So this um, led to Shargoff's rules. So Shargoff's rules, basically, to just summarize, A's equal T's as far as percentages in a DNA molecule, and G's equal C's. The way that you would use this on a test, if I give you the percentage of guanines, let's say it's 20%, well, you automatically know the cytosines are about 20% too. 20 plus 20 is 40 out of 100% of the total nucleotides, leaving 60% behind. Well, of the 60%, we know half of those have to be adenines and half have to be thymines. Why half and half? Well, they pair up with each other in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you are even given one of these nucleotide percentages, you should be able to figure out the other three. The structure of DNA, the final structure, the three-dimensional double helix, the kind of spiral staircase look of DNA, was discovered by Watson and Crick. However, Rosalind Franklin was also instrumental in that discovery. Her X-ray photographs were interpreted by Watson and Crick, and, um, and the true structure of DNA was then discovered. All right, replication of DNA during the S phase of interphase. Remember, interphase has G1, S, G2. You make DNA during the S phase. You separate the DNA, the chromosomes, during mitosis. So replication doesn't happen during mitosis, during the M phase. It happens before that, during the S phase. Here's the central dogma, the basic uh, uh, dogma of how genetic information flows within a cell. DNA making a copy of itself is called replication. That happens in the nucleus. DNA making a copy of RNA is called transcription. And RNA being used to make proteins is called translation. One way to help you remember this, there's two A's in translation. What are proteins made out of? Amino acids, AA, 
translation, AA. So that's one possible way to help you remember it. Transcription only has one A in it. These kind of words sound very similar to each other, trans, trans. Replication is the one that you make DNA with. But, um, you know, if you figure out another trick, please feel free to share it. All right, base pairing rules in DNA. Purines, attorney generals are pure. Adenines and guanines are the purines. They have a um, two-ring structure to the nitrogenous base. Remember these A's, T's, C's, G's are called nitrogenous bases. The pyrimidines, if you remember the trick that we used in class, cut the pyram pyramid stones. C, U, and T are all the pyrimidines. They have a single ring structure for the nitrogenous base. And um, it's always a purine with a pyrimidine, as you can see from this picture. We have a pyrimidine matched with a purine. A pyrimidine matched with a purine. Now, the weak bond holding the nitrogen bases together are called hydrogen bonds, and they're easily broken. And that's good, because we need to get at those codes during transcription and translation. Remember that the capital letters, A, are straight lines. Bind with the capital letters, straight lines, T. Curvy, capital letter, with curvy capital letter, C with G. All right, copying DNA. Remember that we have one old strand in our new DNA molecule and one newly synthesized strand. This is called semi-conservative replication. Why? Semi means half. Conservative means to keep the same. So semi-conservative means half of the DNA molecule has been conserved. The other one's brand new. Here we have the um, steps in um, replication. Remember, replication is making another copy of DNA. The first step is to have helicase, an enzyme, unwind the, the double helix and basically break down these hydrogen bonds. Now, there's something called SSBs or single-stranded binding proteins that will attach themselves at this point to keep these um, two strands un, unwound. However, I'm not going to test you on the SSB part. The next step after helicase unwinds the DNA is we have to add an RNA primer. It's kind of like the little metal tip on a zipper where you can kind of like, like get things started. We need an RNA primer for an attachment point for DNA polymerase. So primase is the next enzyme, which will add an RNA primer represented by the red. The next enzyme is DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 is the main DNA polymerase. It's the main enzyme that builds the two uh, DNA molecules. And here we have DNA polymerase represented by this kind of blue or this reddish kind of blob. Adding nucleotides. And DNA polymerase has to uh, start at a primer in order for it to bind. So DNA polymerase, complementary nucleotide, complementary nucleotide, complementary nucleotide, all the way down. All right. Now, if you notice something here, we have DNA polymerase working in only one direction. And that's the way DNA polymerase works. So as you can see right here, we kind of have an unwinding of the DNA, and you can imagine the helicase is unwinding more and more and more as we go along. And as a result, in this strand here, we're continually synthesizing. We're adding more nucleotides to the, uh, the strand that's been unwound, and we're just building it without any breaks. This is called the leading strand of the DNA that's being made. The lagging strand has a, a little bit of a problem. We have the lagging strand going in the wrong direction. So as this DNA unwinds some more, we're going to have little gaps here. And primase is going to add an RNA primer, and DNA polymerase will bind to the RNA primer after that. But as a result of the unwinding of the double helix, we're going to have breaks, and we're going to have to fill those in later. The next step is ligase. Ligase is an enzyme that fills in Okazaki fragments. These little fragments of DNA are called Okazaki fragments, and they're only found on the lagging strand that is being made in the direction away from this little replication fork, all good words used in context. The leading strand is being made in the direction of the replication fork, and it's continually synthesized. All right, so ligase is going to uh, fill in the gaps here. We're going to add uh, DNA nucleotides to uh, repair that. And then we have another DNA polymerase, which is kind of cut off here, that's going to... Um, uh, fix any problems. Here we go. I'm down here. DNA polymerase 1 corrects mistakes in replication. So what DNA polymerase 1 does is, first of all, get rid of that primer. we got to get rid of that red stuff uh, made of RNA. We have only have DNA in the DNA molecule. And then we're going to have any mistakes along the way uh, fixed by DNA polymerase 1. And that is replication. At the end of our uh, chromosomes, we have these repeating chains. They are basically like aglets on the tips of shoelaces. They kind of keep the, uh, 
the, um, the shoelace uh, protected with an aglet. And these telomeres kind of have the same role. They're repeating chains that protect the ends of the chromosomes, and they get shorter and shorter with every cell division. Telomerase is the enzyme that builds up these telomeres, and that doesn't happen once the uh, person is born. The only time you actually relengthen those uh, telomeres is when you make your sex cells. And that's why the babies get a full telomere when they're, uh, when they're born. They don't get your old DNA. They get the new DNA or new telomeres on their DNA. Right. Transcription and translation. This ends part one of the review for third quarter AP Biology. Part two will focus on transcription and translation.